get started. Welcome to our Japan Research Centre seminar and our exciting new 2020 format, which we're all used to now, which is online. Um, so uh, I'm Helen McNaughton. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Centre, uh, just for those of you who don't know me. And it's a real pleasure today to welcome our guest speaker, who is Martin Dusenberry. He's uh, the professor and chair for global history at the University of Zurich. Um, but it's a particular pleasure to welcome because he's also a SOAS alumni. So he did his master's in Japanese studies uh, here at SOAS back in 2002. Uh, I also did that master's, but I'm not going to tell you what year I did it because it was somewhat before uh, Martin's time, which makes me his senpai. So he has to do everything I tell him to do now. <laughs> um, so he's um, published widely in terms of, of Japanese uh, and global history. And his most recent work is uh, the author of Hard Times in the, uh, sorry, he's the author of Hard Times in the Hometown, a history of community survival in modern Japan. And his more recent work is also focused on Japan's place in the mid 19th century Pacific world, which is obviously the focus of uh, tonight's seminar. And just as a note, you may have noticed some of you who might have seen his biography. In this year, in 2020, he also launched a text based computer game uh, called Lives in Transit to teach his BA and MA students about global history methodologies, which he's not going to talk about tonight. But if anyone wants to ask about that at the end of the, uh, the session, I'd be very interested to know what exactly that is, because, you know, I'm, I'm really not up to speed on uh, computer games. So that would be really interesting and lead us into a nice discussion as well. So, um, the Q&A button down the bottom there uh, is open for the chat. So if you would like to ask questions, uh, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of this session, obviously. You can put your questions into the Q&A. Uh, if you can do that rather than into the chat function, that would be good so that we can have all the questions coming through the Q&A function. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Martin, who's going to present, and then uh, he's going to present for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we're going to have a chat, the two of us. Um, and then uh, we'll open it up to the Q&A and I'll collate the questions through the chat. So feel free to type as succinctly as possible to allow me to read and, and collect uh, the questions. But his uh, topic, his, the title of his talk today is going to be From Black Ships to Black Smoke. So Karatsu Coal in the History of Trans-Pacific Japan, which I think is a great title. So let's uh, hand over to Martin now. Uh, well, thanks. <laughs> thanks very much, Helen, for that lovely introduction. Uh, let me just start sharing my screen with you now, and I hope that you can all see the slides. Um, so uh, many thanks for the invitation to speak here. Um, I am happy to be back at SOAS, as it were. And of course, in a normal situation, I would be saying it's lovely to see familiar faces. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see any of your faces, but um, if, uh, if you know me, uh, do ask a question uh, in the question and answer session. So, um, as Helen said, I did my MA at SOAS. I arrived um, back in the autumn of 2001. In fact, it was just a week after 9-11. Um, and I was fresh from what was and what remains uh, my formative experience of Japan, uh, namely the three years that I spent on the JET program there from 1998 to 2001, living in rural Yamaguchi. And the reason it was um, formative was because as I lived in the countryside, I began to sense a gap between what I was reading about Japanese history, which I'd never studied before, uh, and what I was actually seeing of Japanese history. And I emphasize the verb seeing here because in the absence of being able to read any Japanese for, well, certainly the first 12 or 18 months of my time there, my exposure to Japanese history was much more tangible. It was about walking and talking and touching and observing. And what all of this led to was a sort of fundamental interest that I began to have in the sites and in the actors of modern Japanese history. Now, in my first book, which Helen kindly mentioned, um, the actors were the small town residents of 
rural Choshu domain or Yamaguchi prefecture as it became in 1871. And the site was the town of Kaminoseki uh, itself. But conversely, uh, due to the history of overseas migration from this part of Southwest Japan in the late 19th century, uh, the town also uh, meant that my historical sites had to include Hawaii, Korea, Brazil, Manchuria, and Southern Sakhalin, to just list a few. Now this interest in what we might call expansive Japan uh, was only really two out of 12 chapters of that book. But since I finished that manuscript, and especially since I left the UK in 2011, much of my work has tried to think about sites and actors by focusing on what we might call trans-Pacific Japan, uh, and particularly trans-Pacific migration in the late 19th century. Now, some of this is a known story, but a story that is nevertheless assigned to the margins of post-Meiji history. For example, the fact that tens of thousands of Japanese emigrated to Hawaii after the mid 1880s, which meant that the ethnic population of the Hawaiian Islands was nearly 40% Japanese on the eve of the Pearl Harbor attack. So we can say that the migration of Japanese was completely transformative for the history of the Hawaiian archipelago. And some of this is an unknown story, which new scholarship is revealing for the first time. And I think it would be remiss here not to mention um, the work of Eiichiro Azuma, um, who's published a sort of completely groundbreaking book, uh, which argues that the construction of the Japanese empire in Asia was fundamentally a trans-Pacific history in which ideologies and practices and indeed the personnel of empire in Taiwan or in Korea or in Manchuria, all of that was constituted through the Japanese experience in what he calls Japanese America. And by Japanese America, he means not only North America, but also uh, Central America. Mexico is an absolutely crucial part of this book, uh, and indeed uh, Latin America. Uh, and very broadly, he also includes uh, Hawaii in this history. I've also put up here Sidney Liu's uh, new book, which is on uh, Malthusian imaginations of an expansive Japan. Uh, and Liu's uh, book is very important in a number of different ways, but one is that it connects the colonization of Hokkaido uh, in the late 1860s, very much to this story of uh, an expansive Japanese imagination in which migrants might also move to Hawaii, to uh, North America, to Latin America, and, to the uh, South Seas Islands. Now, my own contribution to this has been as part of a research team at Sophia University since uh, 2014. And I have a particular interest in the sugar plantation as a site of modern Japanese history, broadly defined. And in this special issue that myself and Mariko Ijima brought out last year, uh, which is in English, although it is in a German language journal, um, we tried to consider and propose indeed the idea of transplantation uh, as an analytical term. And it's worth pointing out here that transplantation is a, an actorly term as well. It was used much in the late 19th century, um, uh, the early 20th century. Uh, Ishokumin is transplanted people, transplanters as it were. Now the bigger picture of all of this um, is that this type of work forces us to uh, engage with the question of the nature of Japan's entanglement with the non-Japanese world from the late 19th century onwards. Uh, where should we look for evidence of that entanglement? Who were the actors who made it possible? In other words, we're back at that most uh, problematic question not only of 19th century Japan, but of Japan to the present day, which is namely, how do we tell the story of Japan's so-called opening to the outside world? And I've, I've put opening in inverted commas here because I think it's a deeply problematic term as, as I'll try to come back to. 
Now, the way that we answer that question is important. Uh, traditionally, of course, it's been told in terms of a focus on external forces, the sudden arrival of an American naval commander by the name of Matthew Perry in Edel Bay in July 1853. So if we continue to focus on these external forces or on indeed elite actors such as your Bakufu or your Iwakura missions to learn from Europe or North America in the 1860s and 1870s, if we, if we continue to focus on all of that, then we bend the shape of modern Japan towards particular sites and particular actors, namely uh, the West and Tokyo elites. And indeed, we, we come closer to falling into the trap of using these metaphors of the closed Japan and then the opened Japan, in which 1853, with the arrival of Perry, is the sort of key pivot moment. But this, it seems to me, is this, this bending of modern Japanese history becomes very problematic, uh, not only historically, but also in terms of the story that contemporary Japanese intellectuals or policymakers tell about Japan's future place in the world as well. Uh, its relationship to the West, for example, vis-a-vis -vis its relationship to China. So today, what I want to do is ask that question once again. How can we retell the story of Japan's mid-19th century re-engagement with the non-Japanese world, focusing on new sites and new actors? And one answer I would propose lies in the print, which you see in front of you on screen here, of Perry's so-called black ships arriving in Edel Bay in 1853 and 1854. Now, Perry's arrival it has correctly been argued, was a crucial geopolitical event in mid 19th century to J Japan. But to date, I would suggest scholars have been more interested in the political of the geopolitical than in the geo. Or to put this in less abstract terms, they have focused both literally and metaphorically more on the bla black ships than what for me is the more noteworthy aspect of this print, namely the black smoke belching out into the sky. And the reason I think that the smoke is noteworthy is because by reverse tracing the story of the smoke back into Perry's ships, back into the corridors of power in early 1850s Washington DC, and then ultimately, back to a US interest in Japanese coal. By doing all of this, we can bring new sites and actors of modern Japanese and indeed global history to the fore in ways which I hope you'll find provocative and worthy of discussion. So, as I've said, among the commentaries, the poems, the letters, the images produced in the aftermath of Commodore Perry's arrival in Japan, and among the copious historical anal analyses written ever since, the geopolitical significance of one detail is largely overlooked. The clouds of black smoke rising into the sky, as particularly depicted in these iconic Japanese prints of, of Perry's two paddle wheel frigates. Now, in fact, uh, any self-respecting naval officer would ideally have desired a fuel which actually produced as little smoke as possible. For the element of surprise in any potentially hostile engagement would be lost if your foe could see your plume of smoke before your vessel itself appeared over the horizon. So for this reason, we need to think technically for a moment, as did the naval planners of the time. For as steam power revolutionized the nature of transoceanic shipping, it wasn't that steamships simply needed coal, but that they needed a particular kind of coal. And you might think that this was simply the coal with the highest carbon percentage and therefore what is technically called the highest calorific value. 
which translates into more miles to the tongue. And that type of coal would be anthracite coal. But the problem was that most anthracite coals also tend to be extremely hard. And this makes for a storage problem in your ships, because as the ship rolls in the sea, the likelihood of the coal suddenly shifting, especially hard coal shifting, uh, and then imbalancing the ship is much higher. So what you ideally want in the hold of the ship, in the bunkers, is a softer coal, which won't shift so quickly, which will, uh, the pieces of coal will hold on to each other a bit more. And this therefore leads us towards the desire for a softer bituminous coal. And in fact, in certain locations around the world, you would find coal that uh, had both of these properties. And uh, in the late 19th century, mid 19th century, in fact, uh, this coal uh, in particular came from South Wales. So best Welsh, it was called. Uh, and it was suitably soft, but it also had a calorific value, which was comparable to anthracite. And it was almost smokeless and it produced less ash than many bituminous coals, which meant that the ship's firemen had to rake the grates of the engine's furnace less frequently. Now, given the strategic reality, here, here the technical le lesson ends, uh, and please don't ask me too many more questions about these technical elements, but here, uh, given that the strategic reality of steam powered naval vessels was that one should ideally emit as little smoke as possible. We perhaps need to ask ourselves how we should read these Japanese prints. Uh, we might say that they're engaged in a kind of visual hyperbole. Or it also may be the case that the US frigates did actually emit as much coal as is depicted in these prints. We can't know because we don't know exactly what kind of coal Perry's squadron was burning when it arrived in Edo Bay. Uh, we do know that the expedition used a range of coals during its expedition, including anthracite from Pennsylvania, bituminous from Maryland, and also some extra sources from England, plus coal that the expedition purchased at considerable expense while in transit across first the Atlantic and then the Indian Oceans, uh, including uh, the purchase of coal at Singapore, Hong Kong and Shanghai. Either way, however we read this print, the iconography of billowing smoke uh, inadvertently pointed to one problem which motivated the Perry mission. Uh, he, Perry, subsequently claimed that the acquisition of California in 1848 had rendered the United States the new Middle Kingdom in terms of its ability to serve as a highway for the world between East Asia and Western Europe. Uh, and of course, this whole language of the Middle Kingdom is, is a very pregnant language. Uh, but if you take that assumption, then, of course, as Perry wrote in his subsequent uh, publicate, uh, published diaries, then the agency of steam would be needed for US ships to cross the Pacific from the West Coast. And for this, uh, fuel was indispensable and hence rose inquiries for that great mineral agent of civilization, namely coal. And yet, Given the huge price differentials between coal purchased on the west coast of America and that on the Atlantic seaboard, uh, this American Trans-Pacific dream, which you see represented both in Perry's writings, but also in this map from 1848, this Trans-Pacific dream was all but logistically and economically unviable. And indeed, that was the very reason that the Perry mission to open the Pacific uh, to steam powered trade itself by necessity didn't cross the Pacific, but rather went across the Atlantic and Indian oceans, sending its all own coal supplies in advance. So that's one imagination of the world that uh, 
America be could become the Middle Kingdom, but that in order for that to be uh, the case, then it would uh, need to find uh, the great mineral agent of civilization. Uh, at the same time, uh, President Fillmore wrote to the Emperor of Japan in the letter that Perry carried, that he understood there to be a great abundance of coal and provisions in the empire of Japan. And if this indeed were true, then the vision of America as the world's new middle kingdom in the age of steam might actually become realizable. And this is because US ships would be able to restock or recoal using Japanese coal rather than the expensive and restricted stocks, which apart from anything else were controlled by the British in Singapore or in Hong Kong. And so in all of these ways, as Peter Shulman has argued, uh, the Fillmore administration's primary interest in Japan concerned not whaling and not trade, as we've traditionally been told, but rather coal. And already you can begin to see, therefore, that this question about Japan's so-called opening is actually turning into a practical question, uh, as Yasuo Endo argued in 2007, a practical question about not the opening of Japan, but rather the opening of the Pacific Ocean. Now, this is the extent of most secondary accounts, namely that the US knew about Japanese coal deposits and that the Perry mission was tasked, among other things, with making them accessible. But what such accounts do not ask is how Fillmore and Secretary of State Daniel Webster knew about this Japanese alleged abundance. And in fact, before departing Norfolk, Virginia, Perry had read Engelbert Kempfer's History of Japan, which was written and published in English first in 1727, uh, in which Kempfer had described seeing evidence of coal mining near Koyanose uh, in north central Kyushu in 1691, in the area that we now know as Chikoho. Perry also seems to have read, in addition to Kempfer, uh, Philipp Franz von Siebold's German language, Nippon, uh, or rather we might imagine that Perry had the text read to him by his Dresden crew member, uh, the artist Wilhelm Heine or William Heine, uh, because we assume that Perry could not read German. Uh, we know this because Perry later noted that Dr. Siebel also speaks of coal as being in common use throughout the country. Uh, and on visiting one of the mines, he saw enough to convince him that it was skillfully uh, worked. Now, this reference referred to a passage in Nippon in which the Würzburg-born Seabolt described uh, visiting a coal pit in Wukumoto, uh, Kyushu, in February 1826. And this is what he wrote. He said, the coal was brought to the surface through a shaft which gently slopes downward in 120 deep steps. It was foliated coal alternating in thin layers with clay shale. Up to about 60 steps down, because our Japanese guys did not permit us to descend any further, the thickness of the coal strata was inconsiderable and a matter of only a few inches. But deeper down, the strata are apparently several feet in size, something that we could also gather from the extracted coal pieces. Now, Leaving aside for a moment the local technical knowledge which is implied in Seabolt's account, and indeed the guide's desire to hide aspects of that knowledge from prying foreigners' eyes, notwithstanding all of this, this so-called Wukumoto passage was much read by US policymakers. Um, in August 1856, for example, Townsend Harris also referenced this passage as he prepared to negotiate the more comprehensive trade treaty with Japan uh, than Perry had managed to uh, sign in 1854. Harris noted in his diary that Seabolt saw enough to convince him that the shaft was well and judiciously worked, unquote. 
Now, the Seabolt's 1826 description was central to an American imagination of Japanese coal abundance, makes it even more regrettable that Wukamoto is a corrupted place name. As you can see, I had some problems saying it myself. But thanks to local history enthusiasts in Kyushu sharing their knowledge through internet blogs, uh, Seabolt's mistake can be identified as the long closed Hukumo mine in what is now Omachi town to the west of Saga city. And this means that Seabolt visited the southern end of what would later become known as the Karatsu coal field, which was an area which stretched some 30 kilometers north from Fukumo to the castle town of Karatsu on Kyushu's northwest shore. Now, the importance of coal mining to the castle town of uh, Karatsu and more generally to the uh, Karatsu domain at the turn of the 19th century is itself demonstrated by an eight part scroll called the Illustrations of Products from Hizen Province, 1784. Just to put this in context, 1784 was when James Watts designed uh, the revolutionary steam engine in Britain. Alongside horse breeding, whaling, pictured here, uh, pottery production, deer and wild boar hunting, falconry, cormorant fishing, coastal fishing, paper making, textile bleaching, blacksmithery and incense production. Mining is presented in these scrolls as a significant proto-industry of the domain. And in the third scroll, laborers are depicted both at a surface level, uh, hewing open coal, and also as entering the reinforced entrance to a horizontal mine, or what is known in Britain, or what was known in Britain as drift mining. So at this point, on the verge of us going underground, I want us to pause and consider what it means to have traced visions of the transoceanic Middle Kingdom back to Karatsu. And the way I originally had thought about doing this was to explain it in terms of chapters in a book. But when I presented this for an audience several months ago, there were, if not exactly blank faces when I talked about chapters, then at least um, there wasn't great engagement with the ideas and so it was suggested to me that I should change the metaphor to episodes in a box set. So uh, imagine that we are trying to pitch for the, um, the, the producers of a modern Japan season one box set, an episode uh, about modern Japan. Now instead of pitching that episode in a way that begins with Perry's frigates puffing their way over the Pacific horizon. It seems to me that we can now start with a different storyline. Namely, we would start with the proto-industrial uh, proto coal mining in 18th century Kyushu. And then we would continue through the mediation of cautious Fukumor chaperones and their visitor from Wurzburg to the corridors of the White House in the early 1850s. And only then would the episode culminate in the Commodore's mission arriving in Edo Bay. So if the woodblock print of belching steamships were to be the closing image of such an episode, then the Hizen scrolls that you see here could be its opening with their coal mining scenes juxtaposed to more traditional images of pre uh, 1853 Japan, nets, rowboats, squirming, sea bream, and so on. But this reframing of Japan's engagement to begin not with steamships, but rather with what I'm going to call the terraqueous cultures of Karatsu, this reframing only makes historiographical sense if we shift our focus from the black ships to the black smoke and thus to the fuel which powered trans-Pacific imaginations. <laughs>
so much for the sights and for the beginning of a story, not with the Perry expedition and not even in Washington, but rather in the coal mines of Karatsu. And now I want to turn to the actors. And here I'll start with one of Perry's greatest frustrations during his Japanese sojourn. Having been given some samples of native coal in Shimoda, uh, American engineers discovered that it was, and here I quote, of a quality so inferior that we were unable to keep up steam with it. And Perry himself then later wrote, whether the shrewd Japanese, as is not unlikely, supplied an inferior quality to deceive their visitors, or whether from ignorance of the article and want of mining skill, they innocently brought that which was inferior, cannot be certainly decided. But as good coal certainly exists in Japan, and as the natives not only use it, but according to von Siebold, know very well how to mine it, the probabilities are that they purposely furnished the poorest samples. We are inclined to think after a careful examination of the particulars of all the interviews and conferences with them on all topics, that on no one subject did they misrepresent more unscrupulously than on that of coal. Now, this brilliant little rant reminds historians of the critical distance that we must maintain in interpreting the visual and textual rhetoric of the Perry exhibition, uh, expedition. Uh, we may recall, for example, Wilhelm or William Heinz, a uh, famous lithograph of Japanese officials receiving American gifts, uh, a lithograph which speaks to the wider narrative of the advanced West bestowing knowledge on the curious but technical, technologically backward East. Uh, and here the model train in the center of the print is absolutely crucial. And yet the great mineral agent of civilization in search of which Perry had come to Japan actually lay in native hands at this particular point of the encounter. And when it came to offering that material and that mineral, Officials deceived, misrepresented, and behaved unscrupulously. In other words, American access to coal was dependent on the agency of multiple Japanese actors. And this in itself calls into question the implied asymmetries of global power that we see in Heinz's scene here. So let's think a little bit more about those Japanese actors. Leaving aside the officials, we know from the Hizen school about the men and by the late 19th century, thousands of women who worked half naked and in appalling conditions to hew and haul the coal. The scroll also depicts laborers sifting and packing the product to be carted off to the Matsuda River. Boatmen then transported it in single man's two or three ton barges north to the Karatsu market whose riverine proximity to the mines made this particular coal cheaper and more attractive to the Japanese Imperial Navy in the 1870s and 1880s than higher calorific coal from Chikoho in northern Kyushu, at least until the Chikoho Railway opened in 1891. And here we have an image uh, by the famous uh, watercolor artist uh, Yamamoto Sakube uh, who recalls uh, the, the profound change in the industry when the railways came and put rivermen uh, out of jobs. And his father was a river transporter of coal. And then uh, once you get the coal to the uh, market in Karatsu, there was the journey from that seaside depot to the bigger ports where the steamships were waiting, ports such as Moji, and where steams of stevedores, again including women, would load the coal into the onboard bunkers. And my grandmother, who was in Japan in 1931, has uh, strong memories of uh, seeing women loading coal uh, in Moji uh, when she was there. <laughs> 
Now, this journey from market to deep sea port required a large network of sailing ships. And here I want to draw on the memories of the seaman, the seaman uh, Kato Hisakatsu, uh, who began his maritime career in February 1897 as a deckhand on indeed a coal carrying sailing ship, the Koto Maru, sailing from Yokohama to Karatsu and back. And just as an aside, uh, here's another kind of observation about the way that the modern world works. Even many decades after the appearance of the world's first transoceanic steamships, the power of coal continued to depend on the power of wind. Now, as I say, Kato uh, started his career in the late 18. Uh, 90s, but it's his later recollections in a published account in 1931 about the final set of actors, as it were, in our story of shaft to ship, which is the most vivid of all, namely the coal passers and the coal firemen on board. All night and day, he wrote, their bodies discoloured by soot and sweat and oil until they resemble bronze buddhas. They run to and fro like squirrels in the coal holes. In the eyes of the ladies and gentlemen strolling with easy sounding footsteps on the upper deck, these are the men, golly, the crew, barely regarded as humans. They work in a world of darkness never visited by the sun, a world, a place where the mouldy black air drifts constantly and thickly, where both clouds of fine coal powder and tepid airs or hot winds begin to blow in all directions after grazing your body. And their work, continuing to carry coal with the loyalty of an army of ants, the coal that drives the power, the power that drives the ship. This job is truly the most invaluable on the whole ship. Now, just for a moment of context here, this decade in which uh, Kato began working, the late 1890s, was when the Nippon Yusenkaish, the NYK company, began opening new lines to India, to London, to Australia uh, to Seattle and indeed uh, this picture in the background which I showed you earlier which is showing Japanese migrants arriving in Hawaii they are disembarking uh, from a ship the Nike Maru uh, which would later open the Yokohama uh, Seattle line in 1896. So Japan is emerging as a modern shipping nation in the 1890s and by the time that Kato was writing in the 1930s uh, Japanese steamships were in many ways considered the queens of the Pacific, as the NYK Museum in Yokohama makes clear. So again, there's maybe a sort of element of hyperbole in this source. Uh, I actually think it's possible that the engineers or the bridge officers or indeed the cooks and steward, stewards uh, might have had something to say about who had the most invaluable job on the late 19th century, early 20th century steamship, not to speak of the financiers, the shipwrights and the interior designers. But the point is this, the firemen, the passers, the stevedores, the boatmen, the packers, the sifters, the haulers and the hewers also embodied this trans-Pacific history of Japanese re-engagement with the world, no less than the Euro-American elites whose interest in Karatsu had brought Perry to Japan in the mid-1850s, and no less than the trans-Pacific migrants with whom I began this talk. Indeed, we might even go so far as to borrow the language of the go-between in intellectual and cultural history, namely uh, the, the actor who uh, articulates relationships between disparate worlds or cultures by being able to translate between them. And if we take this idea and then apply it to coal, we might argue that the act of hewing or of firing was also one of translation, uh, but rather between the natural and the human worlds. By this logic, then, the men and women squirreling coal from Karatsu to the transoceanic steamships were also crucial go-betweens in the history of oceanic Japan and therefore key actors in our season one storyline. So let's try and wrap all of this up. In his groundbreaking 1992 essay, 
Kennecott Journey, The Paths Out of Town, William Cronin examines how an abandoned copper mining town in South Central Alaska became for a few short decades in the early 20th century, connected to the rest of the world. Uh, what his essay forces us to do, in other words, is to tell a different story of socio-political transformations in the modern world, one that is grounded in local experience, local actors and local sites. Now, in haste, I've tried to do something similar today uh, by tracing the paths back to Karatsu and then once again out from Karatsu to the story of 19th century Japanese shipping. I've focused on sites and actors that are not usually at the fore of mid 19th century Japanese history, particularly not when it comes to the iconic story of the opening of Japan. So the question is, what does all of this add up to? Well, uh, this paper was written uh, for a book which will be coming out sometime next year, we hope, uh, a collection of essays about oceanic Japan to try and rethink the relationship of Japan to the seas uh, in the Tokugawa and then modern periods. But as I've argued here, uh, that story of oceanic Japan must be as much a story of the ground as of the sea, because uh, coal power bound ships to the ground in ways that wind power did not. And for this reason, I've used this language of terraqueous, uh, which was uh, coined by Alison Bashford in a 2017 essay. She's interested in thinking about the sort of interface of land and water in the modern world, and particularly on uh, thinking of actors such as merchants, fishers, traders, pilgrims, migrants, and so on. So I'm sort of trying to speak to this wider literature of terraqueous history to challenge uh, the idea that we can just think about oceanic Japan in terms of water and ships. The second thing that I hope I can try and show from this story is that there were obviously global transformations of the local. If you're a miner in 1784 Karatsu, you have little sense perhaps that within uh, a couple of generations, the world will implicitly be looking to you uh, particularly the American world will be looking to you in order to fulfill an American ambition of uh, being a new middle kingdom. Uh, and that story is true, of course, of the ways then uh, regions such as Chikaho uh, were transformed by the need for coal in the Meiji period. But this is not just a one-way process of the global to the local. Equally, local transformations affected the global. Uh, and here uh, we can perhaps, as one example, bring in the book uh, by Catherine Phipps, uh, which she wrote about uh, the ports of uh, Meiji Japan. In particular, she focuses on the special trading ports, not the five open ports, which are most famous, but rather a group of ports, particularly uh, located in Kyushu and in Hokkaido, which was central to uh, Japan's export of coal to the Asian world in the Meiji period and therefore sort of uh, force us to rethink the story of uh, the unequal treaties of uh, what is an open and what is a closed port and so on. Um, and it's in this space between, as it were, the global and the local that I think we need to try and fit that national unit of Japan. Uh, we can't start with the assumption that Japan was closed, Sakoku, uh, and we therefore can't start with the idea that it was open. Uh, we have to somehow find a better language, a better analytical language for all of this and better units of analysis than Japan. And I appreciate that this particular point might not go down so well with a Japan Research Centre audience, but there we are. And more generally, I think that what I'm trying to do here is to consider other ways uh, that we might think about Japan's engagement with the late 19th century or the mid 19th century world. I've already mentioned uh, Yasuo Endo's work on the opening of the Pacific. One might think here about Shokunishi's work on 
trying to retell the opening of Japan by focusing particularly on Japanese Russian links from the mid 19th century onwards. Uh, and here I also just want to bring attention to uh, the work in intellectual history that is being done. And I, I point you towards a special issue that I helped edit uh, this last few years on the ways in which sort of history is created in the space between um, uh, East Asia and Europe, both broadly defined. I particularly point you towards the essay by David Meervart, Reading European Histories, Universal Histories in Japan from the 1790s to the 1840s, which is already online. And Meervart's essay raises the problem of what exactly the Japanese saw when they encountered Western imperialism in the mid 19th century in the form of the British defeating Jing China uh, in the first Opium War, or indeed uh, the form of uh, Perry coming to Japan in the 1850s. And he argues that they may not have seen something that we call imperialism, but they rather might have seen uh, an idea of decline uh, in which small nation states fragment after the decline of an empire. Uh, and uh, that therefore the arrival of the British or the French or the Russians is not a sign of Western strength, but rather a sign of Western weakness. Uh, it's quite a complex argument, but the point here is that Japanese intellectuals did not just approach the West as a kind of blank slate, that they were always seeing the West through the intellectual lens of China and the Sinosphere. Uh, and I think this is totally crucial to uh, the ways in which we think about Japan's relationship to the uh, non-Japanese world, that we don't just think in terms of the sort of bilateral relationships between Japan and Europe or Japan and North America, but always at the very least, it's a kind of triangular relationship in which China is in the background of the intellectuals, the politicians and so on. And so we might end with the question, which is what did Japanese intellectuals actually see when they saw the Perry print here? Uh, we can't be sure, but I hope that I've raised uh, enough other questions now to provoke a lively discussion. Many thanks indeed for listening. There we go. Thank you so much, Martin. That was um, that was really great, and and particularly the visuals uh, uh, were were really. Uh, valuable. I just want to make, I mean, I have lots of questions, but I don't want to dominate. I want to allow other people to start typing into the chat. So feel free to start typing into the Q&A chat and I'll have a look at it in a minute. Um, I just wanted to make one brief sort of comment and then ask one one question. So um, first of all, thank you for, for reframing this history. I think it's absolutely fascinating how you have literally taken it back to the full face. And we, we use that expression in England still, well, in English, you know, uh, working at the coalface. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you have literally done that. And in doing so, you have not only reframed that, but for me, I was struck by the fact that you're rehumanizing uh, the story. You're bringing the everyday labor of, of men and women into the story. And with, without which, you know, it was, it's inconceivable that the black ships could have sailed in without that, that labor there. Um, but it's it's very much a, a hidden history that you're uncovering at the same time, literally, you know, an underground history of, of women and men working uh, underground in the mining industry. And um, there was no there was only men in your scroll that you showed. But as you pointed out later on, there was uh, thousands of women working in, in this industry, although later in the post-war they were banned from underground work. And I, and I believe in the 20s when when that industry became a bit more technological, women sort of declined, but there was a lot of women in that story. So I'm struck by your, I'm probably gonna say it wrong, Terraqueus, Terraqueus uh, interface of land and water. It seems to me that there's, there's a, a sort of gendering going on there as well. So uh, women are integral alongside men in the land uh, and underground in that work. But when it comes to going out to sea and, and your lovely depiction of those, uh, sooty, dehumanized men uh, working, that men are the laborers at sea, but women are very much um, uh, on the land alongside men. But it's a very hidden history for women. We know a lot about textile women in this period, but we know far less about 
the mining women. So it's, it's nice that you're uncovering that history uh, for us as well. So that was just, uh, just a comment. But the question that I had, um, and you make the point uh, in reframing this argument that the US didn't just want to open up Japan because of whaling and trading, which is the traditional story that we're all being told and are aware of, but they wanted, they imagined this abundance of coal and they wanted to use Japan as a restocking uh, point, you know, where they could restock. And I like, I like the fact that the Japan, uh, Japanese perhaps tried to hide the fact that they had any superior coal whatsoever, which was, yeah. which was good. So did this, how, to what extent did this ability to use Japan as a restocking post take place? Because as we know, what happened next was that Japan took on its, its own massive industrialization. It used, you know, the big companies, Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, they go into coal production. It fuels their own, you know, steamships and trains and, and textile mills. Uh, they export coal. So to what extent does Japan actually, so presumably there is an abundance there. Uh, it's not imagined. We know that. But to what extent did Japan become that restocking post? Because I think that's kind of left out of the story when we think of Meiji Japan taking off next, actually. So can you give us some insight into that? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Helen. I mean, I think it gets back to then the question of what the unit of analysis is. I mean, we've got to extend that beyond Japan, because as you said, Japan is exporting a lot of coal. Uh, and I don't have the exact numbers in front of you, but it's pretty astonishing. By, by the 1880s, uh, a really big percentage of the coal that's being sold in Shanghai is Japanese coal. And that's a complete transformation of the East Asian world. And of course, that's going to uh, British ships, it's going to American ships and so on. So um, the sort of the, the, the restocking in terms of stopping in Japan and then going on to China, that exists, of course. I mean, I, I mentioned my, my grandmother, uh, that was a ship bound for China, which stopped in Japan, although it was actually by that point a, a diesel ship, which is a different part of the right. story. Mm. Um, but yeah, so the restocking is definitely part of the story, but it, the whole sort of story of restocking and recalling needs to include also Shanghai and Hong Kong in particular. Um, and this is another sort of very interesting aspect of Meiji um, uh, industrialization is that again it's a story we tend to, to tell within the unit of the nation state and I just think that's completely I mean not only problematic but completely wrong um, and if you follow the the main fuel you have to take this to be an East Asian story as as indeed Catherine Phipps argues um, I think the book is called Empires on the Waterfront I, I couldn't remember it when I was talking um, and um, indeed, when you follow the people, I mean, one of the arguments I've made about Hawaiian migrants to, or Japanese migrants to Hawaii is that the sugar plantation in Hawaii is actually a key site of Japanese industrialization. Uh, and that needs to be brought into uh, our stories of, of Japanese transitions in the Meiji period. So um, the, the sort of, well, I was going to say the short answer, but actually it's turned into a long answer uh, to your question <laughs> is that the, the, that is um, realized, that American dream uh, but perhaps in ways that the Americans couldn't quite imagine that there would be so much of an abundance uh, that it would profoundly change markets in, in East Asia. And of course, you know, it, it's, it's an old adage, but it's worth saying once again, this story that Japan is resource poor is only a story about oil. Like it's yeah. not a story about coal. If we think yeah. about coal in the 19th century in the world, then Japan is a resource rich nation mm. and it's really important to get that into the sort of popular imagination as well. Mm. Great thank you. Right I'm going to start picking up some questions from the chat. Um, so first question here is from Janet Hunter. Um, she says great paper always knew that you were an economic historian at heart. <laughs> there you go that that is really a, um, a compliment from Janet there. Can you clarify why the Japanese would have wanted to misrepresent the quality of the coal to the Perry expedition. Um, and if this was the case, it implies a certain level of knowledge and calculation. Uh, mm. Presumably she means on the behalf of the Japanese, on the half of the Japanese, yeah. Good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I don't know the precise answer to it, Janet, and, and, and thanks for asking it and for being here tonight. Um, I don't know the precise answer to it because I don't know what sources exist that might tell the Japanese side of that story. and and. Actually, that's sort of not really my area of expertise, but maybe some out, one out there would, would find something uh, that would explain it. But my guess is um, 
the um the yeah because of the dutch in, in nagasaki and and the europeans in nagasaki that that um already by the time that perry came uh, authorities were aware uh that um there was interest in natural resources in japan and that knowledge had to be tightly guarded um you know i mean the, the tokugawa shogunate across the period of the 17th century onwards is is known for sort of wanting to keep things under control right so um i suspect that there's an element of um you know trying not to be exploited there in a increasingly imperial world um and that as you say you know suggests that there is a more complex story of mid 19th century interactions between japan and the outside world than you know japan as the overward recipients of technological expertise from the west right uh, so i hope that this story adds to that but uh, I don't actually have any evidence of what might have been going on in, in the thinking then. We, uh, so far as I know, we can only read that from uh, Perry's uh, diary. Thanks. Uh, we have another uh, question here from Jonas and he says, I'm intrigued by the concept, Terek, he's making me say it again, Terek Quais, <laughs> uh, yeah. to describe coal resources. So at the time of Perry's coming, there were no steam engines operating in Japan yet and Western shipping was still mostly carried out with, you know, sa sailing. So what do we do with the fact that coal was obviously used uh, significantly in Japan without mechanical industrialization, but rather for other uses? And he gives the example of boiling down sea salt. So how does the energy regime change towards fossil fuels without steam engines undermine both the idea of the Terakaius resource and of the Anthropocene as we think of it in the European trajectory? Whoa, that's a big question. Have you got yeah. that? Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Jonas. Jonas is, I suspect, typing that from somewhere in Switzerland. And thank you very much for that <laughs> nice, easy question. It's not one of your students, is it? Uh, it's uh, not officially, no, but he's uh, he's a PhD student, uh, a very uh, good brilliant. PhD student. Okay, he's testing you. He's testing you live. He's well done, Jonas. Part of this Oceanic Japan project. Um, so uh, I suspect what you're wanting me to suggest, uh, Jonas, is that it complicates the story of energy transitions. And indeed, I know that. I mean, you're you're more aware of this than I am, but that the energy historians actually find the the whole idea of transition very problematic for exactly the types of reasons you're pointing out right there's no straight line between the discovery of high quality coal in Kyushu and, and of course later in Hokkaido um, and a sort of simple story of Japanese industrialization uh, there's no steam agents as you say and, and the use of the coal is mainly domestic and um, especially for salt production in southwest Japan in the inland sea um, so I, I hope this sort of complicates the story uh, of the modern world, which says that there's a simple shift from organic re regimes to uh, fossil regimes. Um, but I mean, that in itself is not particularly uh, new. Um, I'm not sure that it undermines the idea of a terraqueous resource. Um, I'd rather say that it sort of uh, strengthens the idea of the terraqueous framework because uh, you know, if we, the sort of traditional way of thinking of it is, you know, that steamships are to do with the sea uh, and the extent to which we sort of connect them to the land is simply in terms of, you know, regimes of power on the ship and, and law and, and the types of people who are being transported and the goods that were being transported and so on. But um, uh, Alan Sakula in his book, uh, Fish Story, was, you know, a very prominent uh, person who made the argument that actually, as I said in the talk, um, coal and steamship binds ships to the land much more than than wind. I mean, because our uh, ships have to recoal, and that then you know causes this sort of geopolitical transformation of the world, um, in which places like Hawaii, which were previously not very uh, important in sort of geopolitical discussions suddenly become crucially important because the calculation that the, that the American Navy makes in the 1890s is that if Japan were ever to attack America, it would be able to get steamships from Japan to the West Coast, but it wouldn't be able to get them back without recalling somewhere. Uh, 
And therefore, if America annexed Hawaii and the big coal stations at Pearl Harbor, that uh, that would prevent the Japanese from effectively being able to attack the west coast of America. So the annexation of Hawaii you know, becomes a kind of defensive point in which coal is central to the thinking and suddenly Hawaii becomes strategically crucial to the 19th century world. So I, I would say um, the, the, this strengthens the idea that land and sea are uh, in, entwined in very complex ways uh, rather than sort of separate spheres. And I, I know your work argues that too, Jonas. As to the Anthropocene, if, if I may, I might just leave that to one side because I'm going to get into an area that I'm not at all confident about speaking about. But that's maybe a, a discussion you, who, who have a lot more knowledge than I do, uh, could, could uh, speak to. Yeah. Um, Alison asks, what did Japan mean by a middle kingdom? Or is that the, the Sino-US you know, concept there? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, uh, we're getting into Tokugawa intellectual history here, which <laughs> has never been my forte. Uh, but um, uh, obviously you have this idea in the Sinosphere that, you know, uh, the, the, the China, let's call it China, uh, is, is um, the most civilized, the sort of pinnacle of civilization in the world. And that that sort of places China at the middle of the world. This is the sort of traditional Middle Kingdom framing. Then you find uh, Tokugawa thinkers in the, uh, well, particularly in the early 19th century who begin to say, well, um, actually, wait a sec, we could think of um, Japan as a Middle Kingdom because actually uh, this is a sort of new Confucian way of imagining the world. Uh, Japan in many ways is, is more civilized than China uh, and they, they provide sort of intellectual justifications for this. And this is part of a sort of repositioning of Japan in the Sinosphere that again is sort of crucial to understanding the development of, of late 19th century um, leaving Asia discourses. Uh, it's not just about Europe, it's about the relationship of Japan to, to China. Um, I don't know how conscious Perry is of picking up on this language when he uses it in his diaries, but um, Clearly, you know, people in North America and Europe understood this whole idea of the, the Middle Kingdom. I, I imagine that Perry was trying to be deliberately provocative here and say, hey, you know, uh, this, this terminology doesn't belong to China anymore. We, America, are the Middle Kingdom. Um, there's a statement here, more than a question, I think, from Joseph, who says, uh, which helps answer the question I posed, I think. Your reframing of the importance of coal is also supported by the chronology of the US-Japan Treaty. So the 1854 treaty that you mentioned opened up Shimoda and Hakodate as supply ports rather than trade ports where US ships could take on coal. So not until the 1858 treaty were Japanese po uh, ports open for US-Japan trade. So yeah, so those uh, supply ports were definitely where US ships were taking on coal. So thank you for, uh, I think, pretty much adding to that. Uh, uh, and then yeah. just to add to that, that's where Catherine Phipps's work is very important in saying it's not just about the, uh, the five treaty ports, but it's also about um, these um, open ports and special trading ports um, of which she particularly focuses on 21. I mean, it's a serious number of ports, uh, which then are particularly developed to help the export of coal and rice from Japan. So yeah, thanks for that comment. Mm. Uh, so Penny Franks, another great economic historian of Japan, asks, uh, what was the market and uses for Karatsu coal in the Tokugawa period? Uh, she said, I think you've just answered this, but it has all sorts of implications in a great divergence context if it's not used uh, simply as a, as a fuel source. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And thanks for linking to the Great Divergence as well. I mean, for those of you who are not perhaps familiar with the Great Divergence debate, um, this comes out of a, um, a set of debates in the 1990s among economic historians about uh, to try and answer the question about um, uh, the nature of economic difference between China and Europe in particular uh, from the sort of end of the 18th century onwards. And it's sort of characterized by a book called The Great Divergence by Ken Pomerantz, which was published in 2000, but um, he didn't coin the phrase himself. I think it was coined by Samuel Huntington, in fact, in, in the class of clash of civilizations. And Pomerantz's argument is to say that, you know, actually, uh, in many ways, uh, there isn't any kind of serious divergence between China and the European uh, economic world until about 1800. And in many ways, uh, Europe looks like a kind of normal uh, 
rather than an exceptional uh, economy. Uh, and therefore we can't sort of explain the European uh, transformation in the 19th century according to sort of cultural explanations or because you know the Europeans were far more innovative or because they had better political structures or whatever all these sort of old older debates and Pomerantz's argument is to say you know there are two really key crucial elements here one is that Europe had access to colonies which changed the whole nature of the European market and allowed also the the production of foodstuffs overseas in particular sugar, which could then feed industrial workers in, in Britain in particular, but in, in Europe. And then the other key element was coal. Uh, and not only coal, but access to coal uh, in ways that meant it could be transported very quickly. China, of course, had a lot of coal, but it was you know, far away from the Yangtze Delta, where much of the sort of proto-industrializing work was being done, whereas England's coal, in particular, uh, Northwest coal, and as I say, Welsh coal as well, was very close to the transport networks uh, in terms of sea and, 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 and river and so on. It could be transported all over Europe as well. So uh, it was the position of coal that helped explain uh, the, the, the huge economic divergence that then you see in the 19th century. Uh, how does Karatsa fit into that? I mean, I think it, it relates back to Jonas's question of, you know, why didn't uh, Japanese um, uh, people, industrialists use coal in what we would consider be, to be sort of more um, rational, you know, productive ways. But I think Pomerantz himself would say that's the wrong way of phrasing the question. You phrase it as a negative. Why didn't Japan use coal in a particular way? And the more interesting thing is to say, look, the way that the Japanese economy was set up in the Tokugawa period made perfect sense. Uh, just as uh, the way that the Chinese economy was set up uh, in the sort of late 18th century. Uh, and that it's this sort of accidental uh, discovery. I mean, uh, um, the, the geopolitics of, of coal, which mean that we now think of the steam engine as sort of, and the water mill as, as crucial technological developments. And we don't think about the wok as a crucial technological uh, development the walk, of course, being a way of cooking that saves fuel. Uh, so I think I think um, uh, probably if you're trying to fit this into a sort of Pomerantz frame, you would say this is another example of how Karatsu or how Japan and East Asia sort of don't quite fit the models that we want to impose on them. That once you have the natural resource, there must be industrialization. Sorry, that's a terribly long-winded answer, and, and you know much more about it than I do. But yeah. Uh, that's that's my initial stab at how it speaks to the Great Divergence debate. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've got a comment and question here from Roger Macy. So he says, your late observation of the coal toilers in the hold of the ship was, I think, from the 30s, uh, when oil as a ship's fuel was generally replacing coal. So comparing the exploitation of coal with oil has all sorts of implications. So the very extraction of coal requires more of the value to flow back, flow back to the hewers and toilers, uh, however much they might be exploited in the process. So could this have been of indirect benefit to Japan? Oh, that's a good question. You're getting some uh, really good questions. I'm glad it's you presenting tonight, not me. <laughs> um, I mean, the straight answer is, I'm sorry, Roger, I don't know the answer to that. Um, um, I think the first question to ask here is, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the value flowing back to the hewers and toilers. Um, uh, I think that's a lot to do with the market price of coal. Um, and I, this gets me into a territory that I'm, I'm not very familiar with, I'm sorry. Um, and one of the things that I think um, is quite important to know about all of this is that, uh, this is a bit of an aside, but it affects the economies of what we're talking about, is that obviously in a, in a, in a wind-powered uh, ship economy, um, you don't have to worry about carrying fuel. Whereas once you get into a coal-powered ship economy, you've got to have big bunkers that will get your ships from Japan to Hawaii or Japan to Seattle or wherever it is. Uh, and that then uses up valuable uh, space in the hold that you could charge for freight. And this is one of the reasons that then you see a sort of economic transformation in 19th century Japan from, you know, small individually owned ships, which is the classic sort of kitamaibune uh, 
model from northern Japan of these uh, regional ships sailing through the inland sea to Osaka and carrying goods to Osaka and then carrying goods back to north of Japan. That could be a much more individualized model of ownership. Um, but the minute you start getting into the big economies of, you know, big ships that have to have big storage space, that begins to get beyond the, uh, the capabilities of individual financiers. And that's then, to, to get to your point, Helen, why you suddenly have Mitsui and Mitsubishi and all these big companies becoming uh, very key players here. It's, it's to do with the use of space within the ship as much as anything else. Mm. So that doesn't really answer your question, Roger, but... Uh, uh, well, it's it's you. it's a it's a tricky question, and I and I and I don't really want to make a stab at answering it either because I get myself into hot oil. Yeah. But I, I wonder if he, he, I mean, when he's talking about the value, uh, the value flowing back to the hewers and toilers. I mean, just to comment, I mean, on on female labour, we know that um, a lot of that labour was actually couples working. So yeah. you were eighty percent of of women who worked. Um, in the period that you're talking about were married women and often working with alongside husbands right. and so and and it was quite well paid uh and relatively speaking for the day so i don't know if that comes into the, the sort of value flowing back but but certainly later on and uh, when the big companies you know really start investing it then then you're looking at a different value flowing back can't you to to companies uh, as well as workers or employees by that stage so um yeah, that's a good point yeah, yeah. i'm not sure Okay, right, but thank so you, Roger. If you want to add anything later, feel feel free, but I should probably move on to other questions. Um, so SJM says, I'd love to hear more about, well, it says, thank you for your fascinating talk, Martin. Uh, I'd love to hear more about lives in transit. Lives in transit. Um, gosh, where did it begin? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it was an accidental project, as these things usually are. Um, I... Uh, I'm trying to write a book um, and have been trying to write a book for absolutely ages about steamships in Japan, about one particular steamship um, as a way of sort of trying to rethink our story of, of Meiji Japan. Um, as when I got the job in Zürich, um, we decided to put in a funding application for uh, a bigger project, which was shared between here and, and now Munich um, about steamships in the late 19th century world. And one aspect of that was a digital project. And I was very interested in sort of trying to use digital um, technologies, not in order to do uh, sort of big data history, which is, I think, many of the ways that, that our university administrators want us to think that history is done, which is sort of, you know, you, you feed all your data into databases and, and then you, you press buttons and off you go. Um, but rather, if we could use digital to um, tell stories in new ways. Uh, so that was sort of the funding application that I put in to the Swiss National Science Foundation. And then um, when we actually got the money, which was a bit of a surprise to me because it was um, not a terribly strong application, I thought. Uh, then I realized that quickly, actually, what we had in mind, which is sort of, you know, fancy visualizations, wasn't itself good enough. And what I was more interested in was um, trying to get um, my students who were always asking the question, not what is global history, but how do you do global history? I was, I was thinking maybe I could try and create some kind of narrative for them to help them do that, to put them in the position of being a historian and then having to do some research on the topic. So basically that's the sort of genesis of the game is it's a role-playing game, uh, not where you pretend you're a stevedore or a hewer or a migrant or whatever, but rather you pretend that you're a historian uh, and you have you know, to do a research project and then you have to engage with sources and you have to sort of think about where you're going and all the time you've got to deal with your PhD supervisor who can be a pain in the ass and uh, you've got to do funding applications and you've got to you know try and keep your part-time job going and all of this sort of stuff and to try and give the sense to the students that the, the types of knowledge that we are producing as historians is very much situated uh, uh, according to our access to resources, who we are, what kind of relationships we have and that the, it therefore sort of reinforces a, an idea about global history, which is that we have to know the positionality of the scholar in question or the group of scholars. And that inevitably is going to affect the way in which we narrate the world. And, and this is a sort of interactive way of trying to get them to, uh, to engage with those ideas. Uh, but it's open to anyone to uh, have a play. I'll, I'll send a link. Uh, if I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you can have a look at it. I'm not sure if they can see that, but we can we can extract it. Later. Right, 
Uh, there was a question in the chat rather than the Q&A, so I don't want to miss that one, from Thomas. Um, thank you for the fascinating talk. Can you argue that there is something about the potentialities unleashed by coal that makes the states extracting it more expansionist? So like sugar, there's a strong link with empire and expansionism. So that's the one, one question. Then um, he's also interested in how Hashima Island might fit into this history of coal and how the geography of a small island shaped the production of a commodity and social lives of workers there. Yeah, there's been lots of work done on Hashima by, by people like Mark Pendleton, I, I think. But anyway, go ahead. Did you, can you see that? Yeah, I can see that. Thanks. Yeah. That's another really good question. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, um, I suspect what lies behind your question is probably um, the, the idea that, uh, what's his name, Timothy Mitchell, is it, has in his book on oil democracy, I haven't got the title right, but the idea that particular fuel regimes affect the way that power works. Uh, and then the question, is there something sort of specific to coal that affects, um, uh, that, that maybe affects a mindset of an expanding empire or something like that? Um, just as, you know, um, the sort of logic of sugar in the Caribbean led European empires into a particular set of sort of land ownership structures uh, and, and labor structures, of course, slavery uh, uh, in that particular area. Um, I think it's a brilliant question. I don't, I'm, I feel like a broken record. I don't know. Um, um, I mean, I think um, there's, I can't, I can't speak for sort of states in general, but certainly uh, one of the things that, I mean, Phipps does in her book and that others have, have done is to say that the story of recalling is absolutely central to understanding Japan's expansionist wars, um, the Sino-Japanese war, the Russo-Japanese war, uh, and that you sort of need to know uh, about how the Imperial Japanese Navy was getting its fuel supplies in order to be able to fight on the Asian continent. She has a brilliant chapter, I think a whole chapter, or at least a section in her book in which she sort of tells the story of the Sino-Japanese War from Moji um, and from the sort of coal refueling ships that were passing through Moji on a regular basis. Um, so, I mean, I think it's indisputable that coal helped Japan expand uh, but whether it in itself has a dynamic that sort of leads nation states towards expansion, I, I, I just don't know. I mean, that, that would be something for others to answer, but it's a really interesting uh, question. Thanks. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And the, the story of Hashima Island has been told by uh, scholars such as um, Mark Pendleton and Peter Matanle at Sheffield. And, and it is a fascinating story. And I'm I'm struggling to remember whether it was Mitsui or, Mitsui or Mitsubishi, one of them, definitely not Sumitomo, it was one of the M's, and it was uh, their, their company that had the island as a, as a coal mining uh, island. And it, it's an amazing story of, of literally a city of people living on that island, you know, and it had everything, hospitals, you know, shops, education, housing, and, and they literally, when they decided to stop mining coal on Hashima, they literally left the island overnight. So not overnight, but in the space of a week or two. And it, and it is this deserted uh, island where you, can, uh, you can't visit. It's a UNESCO heritage site, but those who have visited for research like Mark and Peter and from Sheffield uh, have these amazing photos of this abandoned island where thousands of, of people who lived there literally left quickly and, and you can see this, this abandoned island slowly decaying. So it's a fascinating story if you want to follow up, follow up with those Sheffield scholars. And I mean, from the sublime to the ridiculous, but wasn't one of the James Bond films yes. uh, filmed there? Yes. Well, yeah. Oh, sorry yeah, to, so sorry the one to lower where, the tone. Yeah. No, no, I, was, I, I, I would have lowered the tone actually myself, but uh, it's that uh, one where Javier, what's his name, the villain Javier, yeah, he, yeah, lures, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he lures 007 into his lair, and that is... Uh, supposedly on Hashima Island, yeah. Okay, uh, so we, should we go back to some... Uh... <laughs> I don't know if everyone can see, but I put the Lives in Transit link in chat. I don't know oh, if brilliant. can see that. Oh, brilliant, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, 
Uh, a question here from Annabelle saying, you stated by the 1880s that a large percentage of coal being sold in Shanghai was from Japan. So was Japanese coal significant in Shanghai then in the 1860s as well? Or was that something that only developed later on in the century? Yeah, thank you, Annabelle. Uh, no, it wasn't significant in the 1860s. It's one of these really transformative events from the from the 70s and, uh, and 80s onwards. Uh, it, it wasn't significant in the 1860s because, uh, as, as you may have heard from some of the sort of questions, actually there wasn't a really good extractive technology in Japan, the, the types of image that I showed you from Karatsu, that's horizontal mining, it's quite easy to set up without fancy uh, technologies. But immediately in the 1860s, then uh, Japan, particularly from British engineers, had to learn about deep mining. So basically where you go down vertically. Uh, and uh, yeah, that that uh, is a, a new technology which, which needs to, to develop. Uh, uh, Hashima is important, Takashima is important, uh, um, uh, Chikaho is important in this, uh, and, and that's when you then are able to uh, export on a large scale to uh, to Shanghai and, and East Asia. So that's one of those things where, yeah, the world looks tremendously different in energy terms, or at least the East Asian world looks tremendously different in East Asian terms in the 1880s from how it did in the 1860s. Great. Uh, we have a, a, a question here from Andrew Elliott, who, who is uh, one of our JRC visiting scholars at the moment. Uh, so it's nice to see him. <laughs> um, so he's, he's making the comment that, um, or basically asking about images of Perry and the black ships um, in popular culture today. So he's making the comment that um, the, it got him thinking about uh, NHK dramas like um, Yai no Sakura, Ryoma Den and Atsuhime in which Perry appears um, mid-series, arguably as a sort of a bit part. Uh, so he says, perhaps, he apologised, perhaps this is too far off the topic of coal, but could you talk more about how images of Perry and the black ships continue to function in Japan today uh, in popular culture, for example? That's a good question. He's taking you off topic, though. <laughs> uh, hi, Andrew. Thanks for that. I, I suspect we might have met at some point in the past. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, very nice of you to attend today. Um, I can't really speak very well to black ships in um, popular culture today. I mean, one thing that I think is important to sort of acknowledge about black ships is, I mean, you know, for a long time, I thought black ships referred to the fact that they were black. And I think many people do still think that. Um, then I think it's also possible that that whole idea of uh, Kurobune relates to the, the, the smoke and, and, you know, the, the, the black belching ships, which is, I think, then an important part of the story. But it's also worth realizing that, you know, the, the term black ships was being used in the 16th century in Japan to de describe the Portuguese caracks that were coming. And indeed, in that famous print, that Nagasaki print that I showed you of the, of the, of the belching ships, um, the iconography actually is not of a steamship, it's of a Portuguese carrack. So there's a, a longer history here, which is pre-closed um, country. Uh, and looks back to Japan's relationship to Southeast Asia uh, in the 16th and early 17th century. I think it's really important to, to bear that in mind because what you then see with the arrival of Perry is again, this sort of, this um, lens of memory as it were, in which not only are Japanese intellectuals thinking about China, but they're also even looking back to a longer history of Japanese expansion into Southeast Asia. Uh, which predates the the, the Sakoku um, uh, regulations in the 1630s and is again a way of sort of complicating the story that we have here simply a relationship between Japan and the West. Um, and this is sort of one of the things I was, I was trying to keep arguing is when we tell these stories of the 19th century, um, you know, we, we've got to at the very least have some kind of triangular imagination in our mind of Japan and the West and Japan and Asia and how those things are, are coming together. Um, and um, I don't know how that plays into popular images of Perry today, but it would be something to look at if, if you're interested in this, is to see how, to what extent does the popular use of Perry today 
tell it as a story about the West or as a story about America in particular. Whereas at the time, I would argue, it's much more complicated than that. There's a sort of layering uh, which brings in longer memories of Japanese engagement with Southeast Asia as well. So that would be something to sort of look at in trying to answer that question. But I'm afraid to, I, I can't answer that question myself. Yeah. So Roger has helpfully added a context to the question that he asked earlier saying, uh, for example, the excess value of Norway's oil exports largely sits in financial funds and very few people in Norway have seen the impact accepted in financial terms. So I guess that's what he's saying about indirect, okay. indirect value there. So but thanks. then I think the key point here then, Roger, okay, so now I have a better sense of where you're coming from is, is you know, the, 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 as I said, the, there has to be a transformation in how you extract the coal. Uh, and it is a mixture of big companies like Mitsui and uh, Mitsubishi that immediately invest to do that because you need big capital to do that uh, in a way that is not necessary in the sort of small scale uh, coaling that we're talking about um, in, in, the, in the late adult period. Um, and in other cases, it's, it's what uh, Nakamura Naofumi has called sort of local zaibatsu uh, in places like Kyushu um, of, um, I think there's a very famous guy called uh, Yasukawa who uh, owns a lot of coal mines in northern Kyushu and is, is uh, according to Nakamura, sort of absolutely central at pushing a kind of regional industrialization of Japan. And again, that's another way in which we complicate the story of, of industrialization is so we look at the regions rather than at the center. Um, so all of that adds up to the fact that I don't think then much of the sort of profits of coal trickle back down to the hewers as your question was implying, I don't think it's that different to oil economy, oil extraction economies, uh, because it's big companies involved. And of course, they take the profits for themselves and, and you know, pay as little as they possibly can to the uh, laborers. Thank you. Um, and we have only one, uh, well, comment. Oh, no, hang on. No, that's right. We only have one comment left. Um, and it's, an, it's a lovely way to end, and, and it's exactly 6.30. And it's from, it's from the Daiwa Foundation, but I can only imagine this is Jason James here. And he's ending on a very lovely poetic note. Um, and I'm not quite sure how to copy this into the uh -huh. chat, but maybe Charles can help me. But um, he's got this three-verse poem here, which neatly reflects the declining romance of maritime trade. So uh, would you like, do you want to read the poem out, Martin? I think it's quite No, good. not particularly, no, I was hoping you. <laughs> uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase and summarise it, but it's a three-verse poem. And uh, in the first verse, there's this depiction of, of a, a, a nice boat rowing home to sunny Palestine with, a, with this cargory, uh, cargo sorry, of ivory, peacocks, apes, sandalwood and, and sweet white wine, which is something I'm now craving. And then in the second verse, it's a state, more stately Spanish galleon, uh, which is going back with the cargo of diamonds and emeralds and amethysts and topazes. So again, it's all, it's all very <laughs> lovely. And then we get to the third, third verse, which is a dirty British coaster with a salt caked smoke stack uh, with a cargo of coal, uh, road rails, pig lead, firewood, ironware and cheap tin trays. So <laughs> I think it's pretty much putting British trade <laughs> into historical context there. That's you... true, although what I really like about this is it's important to say it's tyne coal. Uh, and this coal. makes me feel nice and nostalgic for my days <laughs> of teaching at uh, Newcastle University. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much for that, Jason. Yep. And I think in the paper I read, I don't think you mentioned it in your presentation, but the ship that uh, one of the, the early ships, the one that sailed into Hawaii, I think that you were talking about, or, or early Japanese ships came from Newcastle on Tyne as well. So you have that, that English link there as yeah, well. Yeah, that's the ship Taking that I'm you trying back to, home. Yeah. That's the ship I'm trying to write uh, a book about, but uh, watch this space. I hope it might be finished next year. Yeah, great. So it only remains to really thank you so much, Martin, for such a, a wonderful uh, reframe, reframing of history, a lovely visual presentation, and it certainly inspired a lot of um, really good questions, which hopefully should help, help you. You did well to answer those on a, on a Wednesday evening. I know, you, like me, you've been teaching all day, so.
Um, but just thank you to you for, for coming along and, and giving this presentation. Thank you to everybody who attended tonight. We can't see you, but we're, we're, we can see you're there uh, in numbers. And thank you for your, all your great questions. Uh, hopefully we answered them well, or rather Martin did, I think. And then thanks to Charles, who's who you can't see here, but who's, uh, who's runs this whole thing logistically so smoothly and brilliantly. So thanks, everybody. And we're back next week with another JRC seminar as well. Thank Many you for thanks. joining us. Thanks to everyone for all your great questions and hope to see you in the flesh again soon. Yeah, indeed. Take care. Thanks.